Welcome to The Week in 60 Minutes. I'm John Connolly, The Spectator's news editor and your host this week. Coming up on the show. Trump and Biden have agreed to debate each other later this year, but who will Trump pick as his vice president to cheer him on? Freddie Gray takes a look in his cover piece this week. We'll be speaking to opposition leader Tina Bokuchava about the thousands of Georgian protesters marching against the government's pro-Russian policies. Also on the show, Toby Young and Baroness Fox discuss the pet abduction bill and the relentless rise of pointless legislation. What explains the rise of young people saying they are asexual? Mary Harrington and Mary Wakefield join me to discuss. Before we get going, if you enjoy Spectator TV, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon so you never miss an episode. For the cover piece this week, Freddie Gray takes a look at the Veep show. Who's in the running to be Trump's vice president? Freddie joins me now. Freddie, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Great pleasure, John. You've written a great cover piece this week about Donald Trump's vice presidential pick. Um, but I, what I think really comes through in your piece is how much Donald Trump seems to be sort of enjoying this process of sort of teasing out who he's going to pick. I mean, how would you describe his strategy for uh, the vice presidential nomination so far? Well, I mean, it's been said before, uh, and it's very true. It's it's The Apprentice to him. It's his favourite role, which is the CEO TV, reality TV boss, who's teasing the audience while narrating the show about who he's going to pick. Um, and it adds to the excitement of the election. And I think particularly in contrast to the trial, the Manhattan trial, um, which has got all these amazing headlines about, you know, porn stars still, but it's all sort of old hat that, and we've heard it all before. And actually the, the case itself is quite boring. It's to do with tax records. And so I think that uh, Trump is kind of giving the audience uh, a, a, an intriguing subplot by telling them um, that, you know, that, that he's thinking by implying or sort of winking that he might be thinking about this person. The person at the moment is Governor Doug, Ber- Doug Burgum, mm. who is, uh, you know, very rich and Trump really likes having new rich people to play with. And uh, on Sunday at a rally in New Jersey on Sunday, uh, Trump said, you know, he's such, him and his wife, such a great couple, incredible couple. Uh, just get ready for something. Mm. He made his money in technology, but he probably knows more about energy than anybody I know. So get ready for something, okay? Just get ready. And that was an obvious wink. <laughs> um, but he kept it vague. He said, you know, he knows a lot about energy. Right. Um, and this is Trump's favorite thing, I think, is, is teasing it out. And people love it too. The, 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 the MAGA crowd love it. It's, it's a fun guessing game. Mm. It almost seems like his brain is built for television and he's almost... You know, teasing cliffhangers at the end of each episode. Well, exactly. And that's all that's all he thinks of. I mean, he famously uh, says about all his cabinet hires when he was in the White House, he talked about his cabinet hires as being straight out of central casting. Right. Uh, and I think it was Rick Grinnell, who's his director of intelligence. He would look at the TV and he'd say, there's my beautiful Grinnell. <laughs> what a great looking guy. <laughs> Sorry, my terrible Trump impression. No, I liked it. I liked uh, it. Um, we had a crossover event then as well with sort of vice presidential nominees or contenders turning up to Trump's trial. Has has Trump very much encouraged that? Yes, I think Team Trump are apparently uh, urging people to go and show their uh, support for Donald Trump. Uh, And um, that, you know, um, Steve Bannon said, you know, MAGA world, Steve Bannon, Trump's former chief strategist, uh, said to me that MAGA world makes is is clear that they, they expect people to show up and defend Donald Trump from the stick. So if you want MAGA world to like you, and if you want to be vice president, you need MAGA world to like you, uh, you've got to show up at the trial. Um, and this is another way in which he's turning this quite boring trial into something a bit different, something with a bit of intrigue in it. Mm. And for the contenders themselves, I mean, what's the prize here? Obviously, you know, some people would look at it and say, do you really want to be sort of a, the vice president of Donald Trump and all that entails? But presumably they're looking beyond Donald Trump as well when they're sort of running to, when they want this ticket, essentially. I think so, yeah. I think there's a feeling that uh, in, among sort of Trump people that um, Pence, although in some ways he helped them, Trump win the election because of the way it was playing out in 2016, he was a, he was he has proved himself to be the wrong choice. He, he undermined Trump at certain times. He didn't do the heavy work that Trump wants mm-hmm. a vice president to do. Um, and so they are thinking about the fact that Obviously, whoever this person is, Trump is 78, uh, has a very good chance of being, if not the next president, the next leader of the 
of the MAGA movement and therefore the next Republican presidential candidate. Um, and so that is naturally on people's minds, even though at the same time they don't like talking about it because as soon as anyone in Trump world gets a whiff that you've got any ambition that you might come after <laughs> Donald, you're quickly destroyed. So other than the governor of South Dakota, um, who are the sort of top contenders, do you think, at the moment? Uh, well, J.D. Vance is, uh, I should put a disclaimer here, uh, I, I think it's going to be J.D. Vance so much so that I put a small bet on it. Oh, okay. uh, not a huge bet. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that corrupt. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, J.D. Vance, I think, does have a very good chance. Uh, he um, is positioning himself very much as a, a kind of MAGA uh, loyalist. Uh, the far right, if you like, if you want to call them the far right, uh, the kind of Nick Fuentes, Alex Jones, Infowars crowd, they don't like him because they think he's a bit suspicious. Right. Because uh, he's always been well funded and his book got turned into a film by Netflix, which they think is suspiciously liberal. Right. Um, but I do think uh, he has played his cards pretty well. Um, and he is um, he's an American first guy, really. Mm. And he's part of a kind of international coalition of of kind of nationalist populism, if you like, um, that is on the ascendant. I think you mentioned in your piece as well that he's, um, he's got a good chance because he's a bit of a boring speaker as well. Yeah. <laughs> so it's... Well, Trump doesn't like to be outshone. Uh, and in fact, one of the main reasons for choosing Pence was not because he uh, appealed to, you know, uh, white evangelical Republicans. <laughs> it was because uh, he was unthreateningly dull. Mm. Right. <laughs> it's kind of uh, the tradition with the vice presidential pick is usually that you know you find a candidate who complements your own weaknesses so for example you maybe pick like someone from the south if you're if you're seen as a bit out of touch of that area i mean yeah. who who should trump pick really what are, what are his weaknesses do you think what, well, what would he be looking for as if he was a bit more of a regular candidate i think people talk about the way in which they he might complement trump so uh you know tim scott uh, Senator Tim Scott has talked about a lot. He's African American, but mm. also he has quite a biddable, soft personality. And it's thought that he would be a good contrast to Trump, who's obviously mm. quite abrasive sometimes. And that Scott it seems like a nice guy, an easygoing guy. Right. No one thinks Donald Trump is an easygoing guy. Um, but obviously, the, the the contrast that everyone has been talking about, the, the thing that should Trump should do to, for a long time, and we even did a piece about it in the Spectator last year, was pick a pick a woman vice mm. president because. Um, you know, he struggles with women. He struggles with suburban women. People always say, so uh, who, which women is it going to be? The, the trouble is he hasn't really found the right one. Mm. The strongest contender of the women contenders at the moment for the vice presidential slot, apparently she's on some short list, is Tulsi Gabbard, mm. uh, who was not so long ago a Democratic presidential candidate. Mm. Um, and I think the thing that Trump might like about that is that she clashed with uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president, on the debate stage as a Democratic presidential candidate four years ago. And even if Trump doesn't remember that, he might be reminded of that and he might like that. Mm. That said, everybody who can string a sentence together thinks they can beat Kamala Harris in a, on the debate stage. <laughs> so that is because that's an important part of the vice presidential role in the election is that vice presidential debate because that's right. where you can have a major slip up. Uh, or a major success. But like you say, you'll be against Kamala, so it's not a... <laughs> so your, your odds are looking good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you should probably say as well about one of the contenders, uh, the female contenders to be Trump's vice presidential pick, Christy Noam, and, and what in particular ruled her out, <laughs> was ruled her out of the running. <laughs> Absolutely amazing blow up. Uh, I, I saw one TV commentator, Chris Hayes, I think it was, saying, uh, I've never seen uh, a career explode this quick, this quickly. <laughs> uh, it, um, so Christy Noem, it was thought that she had sort of been frozen out of Trump world uh, for various reasons. And um, she published a memoir last week. And a lot of times the vice presidential candidates or presidential candidates will do this. They'll produce a memoir to sort of say, this is who I am, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and her memoir had this extraordinary description of killing uh, a dog a 14-month-old dog, shooting a dog in a gravel pit n near her farm. Um, and uh, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of, you know, she tried to say this sort of fake news that the media was talking about this, but then people looked at the book and it was this amazing description of it. When she then went back and got a goat that she thought was <laughs> mean and nasty, and then took the goat into a gravel pit and killed the goat. 
Uh, she then uh, uh, describes how her uncle, I think it was, was a bit worried because he'd seen her going over the field with a dog and putting a bullet in it, then coming back doing the same with a goat and saying something like, you know, we, we, we hid away because we thought you were... A, you were onto something, <laughs> which which uh, which is extraordinary. And then on television, while defending it, sorry to go on about this. No, no, it's an amazing story. <laughs> on television, to to well, being grilled about this, she then thought it would be helpful to reveal that only a few weeks ago she would had three horses put down. Um, so she's sort of a, a mass animal slaughterer. And you say she this is sort of to impress Trump. Is the There's logic a theory that? that because Trump hates dogs, she was trying to get inside his brain. Right. I also think, obviously what she was trying to do, or certainly in doubling down, she thought she could get away with saying, rural folk are tough. You know, we make these decisions. You mm. city squishes can't handle it. Um, but, you know, dog killing is, is not a vote winner. It hasn't been for some time. Doesn't tend to be, no. <laughs> do you think there's something about the way sort of you have to get Trump's attention more than anything else? And that sort of encourages the craziness around, around Donald Trump. I think so, certainly. Yeah. I mean, I think getting on television has always been the way people do it. Uh, J.D. Vance went on television uh, a couple of weeks ago and said, um, uh, America is on fire. And I sort of see Donald Trump a bit like a fireman. The world is on fire. And I sort of see Donald Trump as a bit of a fireman. <laughs> Which I thought was quite touching because he was trying to say a really kind of <laughs> yeah. Trumpy comment, but he had to, he had to close it. <laughs> Um, you mentioned in the piece that it's going to run on for a little while, this. Um, do you think Trump's probably not going to make a decision for, until July? Is that right? G generally, uh, it's not announced until uh, very soon, I think historically, the night before the convention, but certainly days before the convention. Pence, I think it was a few days mm. before it was confirmed. I think it's possible that given the historic leakiness of Trump world, that a name will come out in June um, but uh, yeah, well, we're probably looking at July before we know for certain. Mm. And do you think Trump himself has made his mind up yet? But uh, people I spoke to differed on that. Well, one consultant said he thinks he has. Another said he thought he hadn't. Um, I suspect he likes making out to people sometimes that he knows. Right. Uh, but he's, he loves the game. <laughs> uh, and actually, so does everyone else. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Freddie. Thanks, Trump. If you like that analysis, why not pick up an issue of The Spectator? You can get a 12-week subscription for just £12, plus a free £20 John Lewis or Waitrose voucher. If you go to spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer, that's there. Next, a brawl broke out this week in Tbilisi's parliament after a bill dubbed the Russian law was passed. Thousands of Georgians have been protesting. Is the country on the brink of revolution? Joining me now is opposition leader Tina Bokuchava and Natalie Sabanadze, senior fellow at Chatham House. Natalie, start us off, could you explain why there's been such a huge reaction to this bill in Georgia? Thank you for having us. Um, yeah, this is uh, not the first time that we see this bill. Uh, it was first introduced about a year ago uh, in March 2023. There was uh, pretty much the same reaction from the public, huge protests, a uh, lot of pressure from international partners and uh, the ruling party, Georgian Dream, uh, withdrew it and we thought that was the end of it. Uh, it was a promise that it will not be returned both to the public, to the Georgian public, but also to, um, to the partners. So to our surprise, it came back and this bill is highly problematic for uh, several reasons. Uh, one is that it is a copy-paste of the Russian bill, uh, which was introduced uh, in 2012. And that law afterwards has been amended several times in Russia, became even more stringent than in the beginning. But the impact of it has been extremely harsh on Russia's civil society, which is completely destroyed. Basically, everybody think you know, with free thinking Russians are, have either left or those who remain, they have to wear a badge that says a foreign agent. Basically, every time they appear on TV, they're obliged to have this writing as a foreign agent. So in itself, for Russia, and the same motives are at play here, this was a, a legal instrument acquired by the state to suppress uh, dissent. Um, so there's one uh, problem. Now, there is also a serious legal problem because it establishes automatic connection between receiving the funding, and we're talking about 20% of foreign funding, and being a foreign agent or an agent serving foreign influence. 
Uh, and uh, this is not uh, in line with international standards, neither European law nor international law. This automatic connection cannot be made just by the mere fact that you receive uh, foreign funding. There has been no consultation when this um, draft was returned. Uh, so the due process was also violated. And moreover, the fines that are included in, in this uh, law by now uh, are uh, extremely high, which violate also the principle of proportionality. So all in all, this is the law <coughs> that is going to seriously uh, affect civil society, uh, academics, uh, and in general, free thinking in the country. This would be the end of free Georgia if it is implemented, particularly in the same way as it was implemented in Russia. So the reaction is understandable. People are fighting against it. They're fighting to defend Georgia's democracy. But of course, another aspect here is the connection with Georgia's European integration, which we hear that this kind of law is going to derail Georgia's prospects. Uh, Har uh, Hungary tried to introduce it in 2017. Well, they did, but the European Court of Justice <clears throat> struck it down for reasons of incompatibility with the European law. Mm. Tina, to on that point about this sort of derailing Georgia's EU accession, um, do you think that's the purpose of this bill in particular, is to derail that? Yes. Uh, with uh, First of all, thank you so much for, for having us in your program. Uh, it's precisely that, to derail Georgia's uh, European path and deprive Georgia of a European perspective. Now that it has become so tangible, because um, Georgia was recently granted candidate status by the European Union, and um, uh, EU officials have repeatedly made the point clear that it was due to the efforts of the Georgian people to preserve our European path and not because the Georgian government uh, implemented the reforms that were required of it, uh, such as um, um, strengthening the independence of the judiciary that is essentially ruled by a, a small influential group referred to as a clan, uh, some of which have been sanctioned uh, from uh, the United States precisely because of their uh, corruption and the corrupt practices by which uh, the judicial branch is ruled. Um, and uh, as Natalia uh, rightly pointed out, this bill was introduced last year, about a year ago, in March of last year, but subsequently retracted uh, precisely uh, because of the large-scale protest. Um, and as a result of that, Georgia received candidate status. But now that candidate status has been received and that the next review from the European Union has to determine whether or not accessions are open to Georgia, much like it was to Ukraine and Moldova, um, where we had been, um, I would say, a front runner in this association trio, but now are lagging behind both Moldova and Ukraine in the accessions process precisely because of the democratic backsliding that we have seen um, in the Ivanishvili government. But now that uh, EU uh, accession process has accelerated uh, and Georgia uh, has a real uh, perspective and, and, and you know, has within reach the opportunity to open uh, the accessions negotiation, just now the Ivanishvili-led government introduces this Kremlin-inspired um, Russian-type law that aims precisely at stifling uh, critical voices, at silencing um, civil society organizations through delegitimizations, through stigmatizing, through discrediting, and essentially um, through liquidating uh, them and their operations. And this is precisely significant. Uh, this is especially significant uh, ahead of the key October parliamentary elections, that if they were to express the will of the people, um, Ivanishvili knows full well will lead to regime change. So, uh, yes, it's an effort to attack Georgia's uh, EU aspirations. It's an effort to derail Georgia's um, EU path. It's a clear shift, uh, a policy shift uh, towards uh, Moscow. Uh, it's declaring Georgia's uh, partners as adversaries. Um, and it's also an attempt to retain grip uh, on power, 
mm-hmm. because some of these CSOs would be acting as election watchdogs. And the very purpose of this law is also to restrict their ability to monitor these key elections that, that uh, are scheduled uh, in Georgia for October 2024. Mm. Um Natalie, can you take us through a bit? What do you think happens now? Because obviously it's been passed by Parliament. There's talk of a presidential veto as well. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And the president has indicated from the very beginning that she is going to veto uh, this law, uh, which is what we expect. Uh, she will return it to the Parliament. Unfortunately, Parliament has the kind of majority, the, the ruling party has the majority, so they will overrun this veto. However, between this, there is going to be, between veto and uh, decision of the parliament, there will be a a short window during which there is still a chance for uh, the ruling party to reconsider and perhaps um, uh, withdraw this bill. Uh, There is increasing uh, attention to what is going on. There is increasing pressure from uh, partners. Uh, There's been an EU statement much awaited. There is a visit of um, foreign ministers of three Baltic states and Iceland um, and, uh, and other foreign officials that are visiting Georgia and expressing solidarity with the protesters. So far, uh, the Georgian dream is uh, not uh, heeding um, any voices of reason. I have to say they're very determined and very stubborn. So what we see is almost like a clash of uh, wills. Uh, Protesters are also not willing to back down. So this will be a very important window, whether the situation de-escalates or potentially escalates. And we will have to see. Nobody knows. But Tina is on the ground. Maybe she has a better sense of... Yeah, I, I was going to ask that. Actually. Tina, what do you think? Where do you think the protests are going now? Obviously, we've seen like mass numbers in Tbilisi. Um, do, you think, do you think we're going to continue with those? I believe so. I mean, the scale of the protests that we've seen in Tbilisi is, is, is unprecedented. Uh, mm, uh, people who've participated in the uh, uh, National Liberation Movement in the 80s, as well as those that were part of the peaceful... Uh, the Velvet uh, Rose Revolution in 2003, uh, they all say that they have never seen um, protest uh, up the scale. I, of course, uh, have participated uh, and have really been overwhelmed, um, not only by the numbers and hundreds of thousands of people that have been in the streets of Tbilisi, but also uh, by their determination um, and their belief in an ultimate victory. Um, I think part of that determination uh, is driven by the fact that a lot of the uh, peaceful protesters in Tbilisi are are young, are youngsters. um, and uh, their drive really is uh, is something, and their determination for for an ultimate victory is, is really unmatched in anything I haven't seen in any protests uh, uh, before that I have been uh, certainly a part of uh, since uh, two thousand since two thousand twelve um, when I came into politics. And so, no, I don't believe they will stop. I mean, they are determined uh, to fight uh, till the end. Of course, the position um, uh, that was also mentioned of our international partners is key, is very, very important. And uh, every single visit that has come to Georgia, be it um, the foreign ministers that we met today uh, from the Baltic countries and Iceland, who was representing the, the Nordic countries, uh, be it the previous uh, meetings we had with the German and the Lithuanian um, the chairs of the Foreign Relations Committee and, and the member of the Finnish parliament, uh, or be it Assistant Secretary of the U.S., um, Jim O'Brien, uh, that I also had the opportunity uh, to meet. They have all stressed that they stand with the Georgian people um, And they stand with uh, the Georgian people's choice uh, to defend uh, our Euro Atlantic um, uh, aspirations. That has been a historic uh, choice uh, for Georgia. Uh, Now, in terms of you know, what options and what tools uh, our partners may have available to them to express that support uh, for the Georgian people, but also signal um, uh, that the government has. uh, that the government is uh, has betrayed uh, that choice of the Georgian people and is trying to derail Georgia's European path. 
uh, one of the instruments that um, is being discussed is the use of sanctions. And Assistant Secretary Jim O'Brien was uh, didn't mince his words yesterday when uh, in a press conference he said that if uh, this law is enacted, uh, because yes, there's still this window of opportunity the government could theoretically use through the veto, although I don't expect it to. Uh, and if uh, the gross violations of human rights continue, um, which includes these uh, widespread uh, you know, use of violence against citizens and peaceful protesters and opposition leaders, including the chair of my own party, uh, this could all, of course, gross human rights violations um, uh, could could lead to the the use of sanctions. I mean, uh, we know what you know um, the the Belarus Act. We know the Magnitsky List, etc. So the precedent for this exists, uh, and uh, there is active discussion uh, for the use of sanctions, which would include not only travel bans, which is what we've seen in regards to the judges that I mentioned. Uh, but uh, as Assistant Secretary mentioned yesterday, would also include financial sanctions, which is, of course, a very, very serious signal from Georgia's longstanding strategic partners, such as the United States. Mm. And Natalie, that's that's one side of the international reaction. I mean, the other is obviously the influence of, of Russia. I mean, Russia has obviously intervened in Georgia before in the past militarily in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. I mean, do you think there's any risk now of Russia being involved or do you think they're so distracted with Ukraine that that's not on the table? Um, yes, Russia is actually the only country um, that has been applauding the Georgian dream um, since uh, return of this bill. Not surprising because it is, as I said, a, a copy of the Russian bill at different levels. It's quite interesting to see the reaction and even a calling on the authorities to finish the job, basically. and. Uh, and push it through. Um, so Russians will be happy. Uh, what role they play is hard to uh, establish because uh, um, there is no uh, obvious evidence that it was, for instance, that the, the government is acting on Russia's instructions or, uh, uh, or, or something else. It is clear that they are acting at least uh, with, uh, on the inspiration of uh, Russia. Whatever they do, the impact will be strengthening of Russia's position. Uh, we, I don't uh, expect escalation to the point that Russia might intervene in the crisis. Nothing can be ruled out, but not at this point. <laughs> Uh, Russia actually is not interested in opening second front, despite what the government says. Um, they are quite distracted. They are busy with uh, with Ukraine. Uh, however, everything is possible. Uh, we really hope that there won't be a serious escalation of this crisis. Uh, but the violence uh, that Tina talked about is really disconcerting. I think it looks like they are... They are willing to uh, use unlawful measures against peaceful protesters that uh, indicates that it's not clear where the limits lie uh, for, uh, for the ruling party. They are uh, really willing to defend this um, for themselves. So it is, uh, I, I think, dangerous. Thank you. That's all we have time for. But thank you very much, both of you. Does the UK really need a pet abduction bill? Asked Toby Young in this week's magazine. Yes, animal theft is on the rise, but have governments got into the habit of making trivial, ambiguous laws, whilst neglecting the real problems Britain faces? Toby joins me now alongside Baroness Fox. Toby and Claire, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Um, Toby, you write in your column this week about the pet abduction bill. Um, for anyone watching who's not been following this legislation closely, can you tell us a bit about what that is? Yes, so it was originally a private member's bill um, sponsored by Anna Firth in the House of Commons and now by Lord Black in the House of Lords. And it had its second reading in the House of Lords last week and looks like it will end up on the statute books before the election. And it's a bill designed to combat apparently an epidemic of pet abduction. Um, and uh, amongst other things, it makes it unlawful to induce um, a cat to follow you down the street if you're not that cat's lawful owner. Um, and in my column, I talk about how something like 12, 13 years ago, um, a cat I had, it was about six months old, called Trixie, went missing. And so me and my three-year-old son at the time, Charlie, used to go out every evening looking for Trixie. And I would shout, Trixie, Trixie. And then my, my three-year-old would go, Trixie! echoing what I was, I, was, I was saying. But after two weeks or so, we found this cat, which I thought 
was Trixie. And my son was convinced um, about half a mile from our house. And, um, and I sort of thought, well, um, uh, the only way to be sure is to, is to get its microchip read by the local vet. I got the cat from a shelter in Queen's Park and they chip animals in shelters as a matter of course um, in case they go missing again. And so, and I'd already registered the cat with the local vet. So, but to be sure it was my cat, I needed to take the cat to the vet. But it was quite late at night, the vet was closed and I didn't want to let the cat out of my sight for fear that I'd never see her again. And it'd taken me two weeks to find her. And my son was jumping up and down with joy. And um, so I knocked on all the, lo- the, the sort of nearby doors to establish that, you know, the cat didn't belong to anyone in the neighborhood and it, you know, left my phone number in case anyone reported a cat missing. And then did walk backwards down the street saying, you know, here, kitty, 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 Mm. seemingly something that's against the law under the (laughs) pet abduction bill, and managed to induce the cat to follow me home, shut her up in my house, took her to the vet the following morning, Turned out it wasn't my cat. So I then returned the cat to the spot I'd found her uh, nearby and then sort of drove off, by which time the cat had become quite... A, my last glimpse of the cat was in my rearview mirror, so sprinting oh, after the car as I was driving off. Very confused cat. And I was, thinking, I was thinking... <laughs> Not only yeah. criminal, but cruel as well. <laughs> cruel as well. Animal, <laughs> animal cruelty. And, um, and I thought, well, if this law had been on the statute books 12 years ago, um, the maximum penalty for walking backwards down a road shouting here, kitty, 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 when it's not your cat, is up to five years in jail. Um, So would I be liable for prosecution? Would the fact that I thought it might be my cat be a reasonable excuse Mm. in the eyes of the court? Or would I have been nailed as a cat abductor and sent off to Wormwood Scrubs? (laughs) So you're making a more serious point as well, Toby, which is that there seems to be sort of a growing number of laws which are best described as a bit trivial. Yeah, well, Christopher Snowden had a great piece in The Critic um, a couple of weeks ago um, in which he said that uh, in the last 14 years, Parliament had either passed these incredibly wildly ambitious pieces of legislation, such as, um, you know, the um, addendum to the Climate Change Act, whereby we promised to achieve net zero by 2050 as if you know, reducing carbon emissions in a small island in the North Sea off the coast of the European continent could have any impact at all on the Earth's climate. I mean, we contribute less than 1% of global emissions. I mean, if, if the idea that we can actually change the climate by legislating in Parliament is absolutely ludicrous. And he gave lots of examples of wildly overambitious legislation like that, uh, accompanied by seemingly lots of trivial bits of legislation like the pet abduction bill and nothing in between. What about addressing the big problems that we face, such as, you know, flatlining productivity, eye-watering dysfunction in the NHS, um, you know, the fact that so many people are now on the sick. Uh, These are things which governments routinely ignore, preferring to focus on things that are either completely unachievable or incredibly trivial. Mm. Claire, I mean, you're obviously in the House of Lords. Does does that mirror your experience as sort of the legislation coming through? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, When I was asked to do this, and it was like the pet abduction bill, and I was thinking, and then, and it's been in the Lords, I was thinking, pass me by. But that's because there's so many pieces of legislation that you look and you think, you can't seriously be making a law about that. Mm. And it feels very trivial. Mm. But I think that there's a broader problem. Um, I agree that, that Chris Snowden's article was great at explaining those two extremes. But it's also, I think, a tendency to want to legislate on everything on some issues which actually require moral leadership or political leadership or some kind of leadership that you don't necessarily need a new law on. Mm. But it's as though um, quantity is a replacement for quality, uh, that old cliche, but it is actually true. The more pieces of legislation you can pass, the more that you will deal with something. And the kind of trivialising nature of this is, you know, we have this ridiculous smoking bill coming up, which is the the time one which nobody who was born in 2008 be able to buy cigarettes but if you were born in 2007 you will and you know 47 year olds will be legal and 46 year olds won't be in the future all of these things but the thing that was really remarkable was is that it was posed as um this is the war on cancer the major you know scourge of our time well i'm all for more work being done in ensuring that we get a cure for cancer. This trivial, petty-minded, liberal bill was not it. So it's an evasion tactic on the one hand, and also I think just a displacement activity for dealing with some of the big issues. And the the final just little bit on, on this is, I think that the other thing that I've noticed is that You'll get these bills in the Lords. I mean, apart from the fact that I'm not really, I'm a legislator, but I'm not a lawyer. 
and they're huge, enormous bills. They literally throw the kitchen sink at everything. The levelling up bill, I mean, it was a nightmare. And what's more is there were hundreds of amendments to it because it became a bill which everyone could interpret as, as they call it, a Christmas tree bill. So you put loads of amendments in, it took months and months to get through. And I can guarantee you now not a levelling up will occur. I mean, nothing will happen. Yeah. That's one thing. Or you get these rather thin bills and you think, great, not as much to read, I can cope with this. But actually, it's because it's a skeleton bill. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is that it basically gives huge and enormous powers to the government, but not necessarily the elected representatives, but to somebody else to fill in the dots. Right. So you kind of get a kind of, we are doing something, don't worry your little minds about what it is. Mm -hmm. We'll do that afterwards, just what do you reckon in general? The, both approaches to legislation are very dangerous and there's just too much law. We don't need, we need to be, I wish they would get rid of laws. I could spend a happy an hour if they were to review. And one of the things that was great, by the way, that was a wasted opportunity was when we left the EU mm -hmm. and they said, we've got these, all these EU laws. And now they've abandoned going through them and abandoning them. I'm not saying lock, stock and barrel. I think go through the laws and say, this is, we don't need it anymore. Tear it up, tear it up. That yeah. would actually make life a lot better for millions of people mm -hmm. in this country. They should have a sell-by date on, shouldn't they? Yeah. They should be fixed-term laws. And after five <laughs> years or ten years, they should be reviewed. Um, often the, the reason for these um, petty prohibitions is in response to a moral panic. So mm. one example that Christopher Snowden gives is um, uh, the government have promised to make it illegal to consume dog meat. Right. And I think that was in response to a couple of tabloid stories about restaurants, you know, selling dog meat. Freddy or dog meat eating hamsters. Freddy, yeah, yeah. And it was like, it, first of all, it's, it's already illegal, but often you find, you know, you don't need another law. You're just duplicating an existing law. But also, I mean, there was no real evidence that that was a kind of nationwide yeah. epidemic that needed to be legislated against. And they did, the, they did the, exactly the same. And the, this is where you get trapped. They actually brought in a piece of legislation that made it illegal to assault shopkeepers. Yeah. Now, the point about it was, was that the, 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 the sanction for assaulting a shopkeeper was exactly the same as the sanction for assaulting anybody. But they named the shopkeeper. So if you're me in your House of Lords and you want to go, what do we want this for? People go, so you want shopkeepers <laughs> yeah, to be yeah. assaulted? <laughs> you don't care about the health and safety of shopkeepers? There are all sorts of things like, you know, I, some of the things that annoy me are things like upskirting or spiking. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence, by the way, that drinks being spiked is a, ma a major phenomenon. It is obviously the case that if somebody actually does, these things are dealt with by the criminal laws that we have. I've made the point about the protest bills, the endless expansion of draconian powers given to the police mm. in order to in, really restrict what should be civil yeah. liberties. Mm. I'm not the kind of person who says that no protest should ever be policed by the police. My point is, why are we making yet another piece of legislation which gives them more power when they won't use the powers they have to police the demonstrations because of other more difficult questions, which is maybe uh, a less partisan police force, a more politicised police force, ambivalence about whether they should be policing Black Lives Matters or just stop all because that's immoral and the police yeah. kind of feel weird or maybe cowardice in some instances. Whatever the problem is, a new piece of legislation will not solve it. Mm. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's often what happens and why you see so many petty prohibitions kind of making their way through Parliament is that there's a moral panic about something like the protest marches every Saturday in our major cities by pro-Palestinian groups. And uh, and the police say, no, we haven't got enough power to deal with this, which, as you say, is complete nonsense. They have the powers if they want to use them. But you know, powerful lobby groups will exploit these opportunities course, to get more power. Yeah. And that seems to be, well, let's hope it doesn't happen. And it's a battle the Free Speech Union has been fighting, but it could easily happen. Well, I wanted to mention free speech as well in particular. I mean, Claire, do you think as a result, if, if politicians say to every single problem, oh, we need to clamp down on this, we need a new law to stop this. Do you think free speech in particular is harm? Because say someone mean, is mean online, suddenly you need to clamp down, you need to legislate against yeah, it. Yeah, because it, once you have developed a form of politicking that involves criminalising everything, then speech is one of the easiest things to do, particularly when we live in a period in which um, being rather thin skinned about somebody saying something offensive, the government's obvious way of dealing with this is to say, oh, maybe we'll make it illegal then. And I think we've seen the gradual erosion of the space for speech. Hate crime legislation is very um, dangerous in relation to free speech because you think, and, and the worst thing is this confusion, you know, hate crime, it's that you kind of think you know what it means. You know, it's like some racist thug going out and saying, I'm going to beat you up because you're black. I mean, I'm, you know, 
fine. Right? But when it ends up being words and people conflating physical harm with emotional harm, if you look at the breadth of um, legislation that was brought in under the online safety bill, which again, you know, the headline is, we want to protect your children from looking at hardcore porn, violent or self-harm uh, videos or, you know, suicide sites. We're all standing there going, what, what's not to like, right? I mean, okay, I get it. Then you get this absolutely ginormous piece of legislation that tries to manage every aspect of your online communication as an adult. And every time you object, by the way, they say, think of the children, you want children to be vulnerable. You read this legislation and it's based on a moral panic. Something must be done. You're chilled into not objecting to it because you don't want to be seen as a monster who wants everyone to hate each other. But actually, these are fundamental, important civil rights, civil liberties. We, we still just about whisper it, live in a free society. And my idea of the law is that you should be free to do anything that is not against the law. And therefore, the law only should intervene with great, you know, very carefully to curtail something of your liberty as a free individual. And that is, of course, what's gone now. Now it's the opposite, which is if it's not um, legislated for, if it's not the state's fingers all over it, they think that they're being negligent mm. and not protecting us, which is because they've yeah. infantilized us and we're like children who need to be looked after and they dot the I's and cross the T's. And as you say, in the meantime, you cannot rely on the National Health Service. In the meantime, there are no houses at all being built to deal with the population of this country, but they, in their petty fogging way, are doing everything but, with the word housing maybe in a piece of legislation, but it's everything but, <laughs> yeah. build the bloody houses. No, you're, you're quite right. The, the great distinction between English common law and the Napoleonic Code was that in England, unless something is explicitly prohibited, it's permitted, whereas on the continent, it's the other way around. But increasingly, because of all these petty prohibitions that are being introduced, it is becoming much more like the continent here. If net it's explicitly permitted, right, yeah. it's prohibited. Um, attempts to eliminate hatred by passing hate crime laws um, is a really good example of um, governments being wildly overambitious. I mean, to think that you can eliminate hatred by legislating against hatred, by punishing crimes motivated by hatred more severely or criminalising various forms of hate speech, hatred has been with us for time immemorial. Um, you're not going to, it's not possible for Parliament to do anything about such a fundamental part of our natures. And the idea that they can is ludicrous. Why don't they focus on the housing problem? Something they could actually conceivably it, do something about. But that's, that's even the thing with hatred. I mean, think about the impersonance. It is an emotion after all. Mm. You can say, you know, we're kind of, and I agree, you know, you kind of think I don't want to be a hate criminal or I don't want people to accuse me of hate crimes or hate speech or anything. But actually, hatred is an emotion and it can be perfectly, rightly legitimate. Mm. And I think I once said on the Spectator podcast, I hate Hamas. I hate Islamism. I mean, I really hate it. I don't mean like a little tiny bit. Yeah. I mean, with a hatred. I think it should be destroyed. Islamism as the extreme form of uh, the most nihilistic uh, ideology in the world at the moment is something I'm not keen on, mm. I hate. The government cannot go around going, you can't hate that, right? Mm. You can't, because they're gonna say then what you should love. Now, as it happens, we've had this kind of, we did have a phase of the government saying, we're going to negotiate, we're going to work out with you your levels of happiness. And if you're not happy enough, you know, so we have had a kind of therapeutic intervention into our minds, but in all seriousness, they are creating thought crimes. And this is just a very dangerous situation to be in because they are basically saying, you have got the wrong emotional response. And we as the state can then have the power to criminalize that and potentially take away your liberty mm. for the wrong emotional response. I mean, Toby, I mean, are you surprised? That a lot of this predates 2010, but for the past 10 plus years, you know, we've been led by conservatives who are no, nominally in favour of a smaller state in general of of leaving individuals to kind of practice what they what they want to do. Are you surprised this has all come in under a Tory government? Or a lot of this has. Yeah. Well, um, I guess 
Um, not so surprised that it happened between 2010 and 2015, because after all, the Lib Dems were part of the coalition. Um, and then we had Theresa May from 2016 um, uh, with and quickly lost her majority. So there, there wasn't much power to do much conservative things, particularly in the teeth of kind of deep state opposition. But I have been surprised by how little progress there's been made in rolling back the frontiers of the state since Boris won an 80 seat majority in 2019. I mean, one of the reasons I supported Brexit is I thought it would mean a reduction in the red tape silting up British businesses and the petty regulations that seem to govern every aspect of our lives, we could free ourselves up from these laws and regulations made in Brussels. What I hadn't anticipated was that actually regulatory divergence meant an opportunity for British regulators <laughs> to impose even more red tape than we were having to contend yes. with when we were part of the we're European leaders Union. Now. Who, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, Claire, you spent you were in the European Parliament. I mean, have we caught up with Brussels yet? Do you think? <laughs> well, in some instances, we're giving a lead. I mean, I think maybe one of the confusion here is that very often um, British politicians use being in the EU as an excuse for things which they wanted to bring in. So they'd kind of take their, 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 their illiberal ideas to Brussels, get them through and then come back and say, don't blame us, blame the Eurocrats in Brussels, right? So it became a very convenient. And I think when they call the referendum, it suddenly became clear that all of those conservative Eurosceptics we're not that keen and they all became major remainers. So you realise that it was a bit of a game, a way of outsourcing authority and mainly uh, basically putting a force field around legislation so it wasn't accountable to the British public. One of the problems about having left the EU is A, they haven't got that excuse. They'll often hide behind actually, oh, blame the House of Lords, because they'll often say, oh, we wanted to do that, but the House of Lords stopped us. Or they'll blame international law courts. And although those things are undoubtedly ways of stopping democratically elected governments doing things. I think very often with a sigh of relief, those democratic governments go, saved, we don't have to do anything. I do, however, also think that they now have to make their own laws. They can't do it that kind of way. And that has kind of opened up a new industry uh, of all the people who are kind of the lobbyists over in Brussels are now kind of just lobbying left, right and centre. And one of the things that really is worrying is that, that we're constantly told that the reason why legislation has been brought into the Lords is because this is what civil society want, because they've talked to stakeholders. Stakeholders. So stakeholders are an absolute scourge on the world, right? Because what they are are lobbyists. I don't mind if people lobby. That's in fact, that's, you know, that was part of a democratic tradition. But they try and pretend that these are grassroots mm. Civil community society, community organisations. Yeah. We had the very peculiar example recently where Rishi Sunak stood in front of number 10, if you remember, and said, we have decided that we're no longer going to give money to, uh, 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 was it go for him? But anyway, we're no longer going to give money to community organisations that represent extreme views. And the point was, it was like, well, why have you been doing that in the first place, right? And they, yeah, basically what they'd done was they'd said, we're talking to Muslim community leaders who they've given a load of money to. But I mean, they created the problem. When you look at all of these third party organisations, whether it's Stonewall or Mermaids, or actually lots of the major uh, charities in this country become political vehicles for social change. The government will then say, we've talked to parents' organisations. We've talked to representatives of children's organizations we've talked to and they consulted. make out, we've yeah and then they'll sort of say to me who are you and they make out that they're the democrats mm. but actually very often this is a done deal of legislation that's done behind the backs of the public and the public just cannot work out what on earth is going on and they often play a double game something i've noticed is that um local authorities will um, have a consultation when they want to do something which is wildly unpopular like mm. impose 15 minute restrictions exactly. on where you can move around in your city. Um, uh, they'll have a consultation to try and garner support to show that uh, they're doing it uh, in consultation with different community groups. And that gives it some kind of democratic legitimacy, even though it's very unpopular. But if you then try and, you know, participate in those consultations and galvanise mm. opposition groups to actually make their feelings known through that process because they've been ignored in the ballot box, the councils will then turn around and say, well, it was just a consultation <laughs> with the elected officials. Yeah, but they'll also, they'll also the say, TV. they'll also make a distinction because they'll say that grassroots anti uh, low traffic neighbourhood group or anti ULOs group funded by the fossil fuel far industry. right, by the way. Yeah. Well, you know, they're far right activists yeah. because actually grassroots organisations, which are often messy and all over the place and genuine and authentic, don't fit this very 
manicured, modelled version of the stakeholder civil society that everybody's used to talking to. They're kind of ordinary people. And guess what? They don't conform to anything, but they are demonised incredibly as somehow beyond the pale because they don't play the game. The main thing that we're saying is, to go back to Toby's article, but it's really, really genuinely a problem, which is legislation is absolutely, you know, like hyperactive. And the danger here is that governments forget how to govern unless they've got a piece of legislation to wave around. Often where they'll say to send a message. Mm. I mean, that's one of the reasons they've done it. I mean, and so it, it makes a mockery of the laws because it creates, there's a whole range of laws that aren't used. And you could say, well, thank God, because I was opposing most of them. But actually, that makes a mockery of lawmaking. Mm. It means that we're passing laws that are never there. They're just like some kind of virtue signaling device. And therefore, the public start going, well, what's the point? I don't trust these laws, right? Why do I take any notes of laws? I thought you passed that law. You've never used it. What's the point of that? Law should be used sparingly. That is the point, and judiciously. And it should be modest in its application. <laughs> and that's even that, because I, somebody said to me when I went in the Lords, you know, well, you're there as a legislator. That's the main reason you're there. And I, and I was like, oh, God. And, and, I, and I have taken the role as seriously as I can. As somebody who really wants to be the director of the Academy of Ideas and do all that work. I've spent all my time reading law and it drives me mad. On the other hand, actually, I think it was a myth. Part of the rule, part of what you do if you're in government or you're a legislator, ironically, is to not legislate. And sometimes it's to rule and to govern and to use your power well by not doing things, by not responding to the latest panic to sit back and also to give a lead because I think you've got a great opportunity to speak out and say things. Mm. You don't have to pass a law every time mm. you speak. Yeah, that's all we've got time for at the moment. So we're gonna have to stop you there, but thank you very much. And finally, more and more young people are saying they're asexual. Mary Wakefield asks why in this week's magazine. She joins me now alongside author and feminist, Mary Harrington. Mary and Mary, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Um, Mary Wakefield, you write in the magazine this week about the asexual revolution. Can you um, start us off by telling us a bit about what that is? Well, um, it was really just that I, I noticed that you know a lot of world leaders now are trying to push people to procreate. Everyone's worried about falling birth rates and population decline um, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you see all these kids on the internet declaring that they're not going to have kids and that they are asexual as an identity. So it seemed to me that um, that this was, you know, somehow 50 years after the sexual revolution, in a way, a kind of reaction against it, a sort of asexual revolution. Um, so that was the basis of the piece. Mary Harrington, um, you've written in the past about the way that the pill, for example, changes women's sexuality. I mean, in terms of the causes of this sort of rise in asexualness, do you think it's a similar sort of thing? Do you think it's there's like a chemical cause here or do you think it might be something else? I think it's probably a, a number of factors. I mean, if, it's probably not the pill, at least not directly, in the sense that if it were it to have been the pill, we would have seen a great many more asexuals for the last 50 years, And whereas this is a much more recent phenomenon. So I think it's a fairly safe bet that it's not, it's not the contraceptive pill that's making... That, that's that's causing this. I mean, it's uh, there. There is some evidence, I believe, that the contraceptive pill does affect women's libido. Um, but evidence from the sexual revolution itself, you know, is fairly fairly exhaustively documented by this point. Suggests that whether or whether, irrespective of the effect that the pill had on women's libidos, it didn't necessarily stop them putting out. Um, for whether or not they be whether, indeed whether or not they enjoyed it particularly. But we're some we're some distance on from that point. And I would suspect that if there are, well, I, I, I would say if there's a, if there's a signif two significant contributory factors, I would say, number one, the internet in general, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate a bit on what I mean by that, and, and two, um, internet porn in particular. I would say are two significant contributory factors. Um, I mean, I have a, I have a hypothesis um, where internet porn is concerned. Um, I joke. I call it jokingly the three laws of pornodynamics, which is to say, rough, roughly following the three laws of thermodynamics. Um, one of which is the law of conservation of energy. And I think the, I, I, I think we, in in terms of the national libido or the the human libido, there's a kind of law of conservation of desire. 
and the more the more effort and energy and and sexuality we pour into um, empty the empty pursuit of orgasm via internet pornography, it's very straightforwardly, the less of it is available for interpersonal intimacy. But I think there's a more general point as well, and this is this is something that my my good friend default. I mean, she she goes Catherine D, who also goes by default friend on the internet, has written about on a few occasions, which is a very interesting bif- uh, split of kind of bifurcation that's going on between how people describe their sexual identities online and how people construct themselves through the presentation of sexual identities online, and how how that may or may not bear any relationship at all to what they do and with whom. I mean, it, it is, for example, increasingly common to see young women who describe themselves as lesbians, who've never in fact had a sexual experience with a woman at all, and who would probably, if you got them drunk enough, and to, to be honest, tell you that actually they've only ever slept with men and they probably wouldn't enjoy it very much if they did sleep with a woman. But they don't, but, but who don't necessarily see the a contradiction there. And it's, it is, it is, for example, actually, it's, there are documented instances of people who describe themselves as asexual, but will tell you hotly that there's no reason at all that an asexual person shouldn't have sex or feel, or even feel sexual desire. And you think, hang on a minute, what, what exactly are we talking about here? And I think, I think really a, a lot of this phenomenon doesn't have a great deal to do with actually making the beast with two backs. And it's very much more about how we create and uh, how, how, we, how we cultivate our, in, our online persona um, in a way which is quite radically unmoored from, from the material world. Mm. I mean, Mary Wakefield, you mentioned that in your piece, that sort of you suspect, you know, sort of girls give themselves these labels and then they're kind of stuck with them. I mean, can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, I mean, I think Mary's right in that you do see different behaviour in person. I mean, you notice that looking at the um, San Francisco Asexual Book Club, there was these commenters saying, you know, great book, but we need more sex in a book about asexuality. So I felt very sorry for them. You know, you're identifying as ace, but inside you, you're longing for, you know, a sort of sexual or romantic connection, more sex in the book. Um, I wonder if, Mary, you think they get, people are getting their sexual needs fulfilled in, you know, online, in fanfic and stuff like that. And that actually, I know you talk about there's a sort of set amount of sexual energy in the world, and if you're spending it online, but... It's a different form of sexual relationship with an actual human, isn't it? Uh, more, more demanding, more intimate, more scary. So you're not practicing that form of more scary intimacy, maybe, when you're used to doing your sex online. Yeah, I think that's certainly. So it's a sort of it's a scaled up version of the the, the mythical Zuma intern who refuses to make phone calls because and, and will only ever text or or send an email because it's because the idea of of having somebody immediately responding at the other end of the phone is frankly is simply simply too alarming. Uh, the the and, and they need that sense of asynchronous communication. I I do think I, for some people who really have grown up on the internet and who've become accustomed to asynchronous communication or interacting via text message rather than in person. Um, the, you do, I do occasionally meet people, for example, who struggle to make eye contact in real life. And it's, and it's easy to imagine that that could extend much further into interpersonal relations, you know, well beyond, say, a job interview or, or having to make a phone call at work and, and, and well into, um, preferring sexual encounters which are which which are conducted remotely i mean you do occasionally find people who will who will overt who will describe themselves as digisexual in which is which is to say you know, ex- explicitly prefer only to have um sexual encounters with people conducted remotely via zoom or whatever and mm. and, and and indeed you know, a whole a whole panoply of exotic sexualities which have no human object at all um, and you know, yeah, anime sexuals, for example. I mean, this is very much Catherine D's territory rather than mine. But all of these really speak to a sense of a sense of withdrawal from from the material world, very much as you say. Yeah. Yeah, and also, you know, once you've, de- I mean, I know you, people do behave differently in person, but once you've described yourself as ace and met a whole bunch of people in ace meetups, it must be a little bit hard to then turn around and say, well, I'm not ace anymore. Or I'm grey sexual or demisexual or it, it it sort of seems to pin you in place. I don't know. I mean, I remember I, I used to identify myself as a lesbian. I remember feeling vaguely as though I'd let the side down when I when I stopped doing that, or just kind of gradually gradually failed to keep it up. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, it wasn't it wasn't. I mean, this was this was some time ago now, and perhaps perhaps identities are, are very much are, are that much more important that it was 
significant. But I remember thinking at the time, if if I lose if I lose friends as a consequence of this, then they probably weren't very good friends anyway. So whatever. Um, I, d- I don't know if the terrain has changed sufficiently at this point that that would feel that would feel very much more existential. Perhaps for some people who are who are really very you know, exclusively online in terms of their sociality. But I think another another aspect. You know, if we're thinking about you know asexuals painting themselves into a corner, you know another another aspect of it might might be that you know as much as you say in your article, congratulations, you just invented women. Um, you know these these people who identify themselves as demisexual, as in you know, they feel they feel desire only after and only in in the context of an intimate relationship. I mean, it strikes me that describe that calling yourself asexual is a, is a, is an, is a pretty sensible thing to do in a context where there are no social guardrails against to to head to, to protect you against the expectation of casual sex and if that's just not something that you're into um I can easily understand how somebody could have perfectly normal you know, erotic desires and you know, yearnings for an intimate relationship, and and very and, and simply end up calling themselves asexual because the idea of plunging into hookup culture or being plunged into by hookup culture just doesn't appeal. I sus- I also suspect that a lot of the individuals who embrace this are young women, and I think that's probably not. A yeah, I mean, I saw someone online saying um, they realised they were asexual when they didn't want to have sex on the first date. Or they were, they were, they were well, I mean, this is exactly great what I mean. sexuals. Like, that, that's just normal, you know. What it's do you normal, think is normal? Right. I mean, it used, but the thing is, it used to be, and it isn't now. That's that's the whole point, you know. We we sit here, you and I sit here, boggling at this. Yeah, you know, from the but I mean, yeah, to, and and you know, it, being. yeah, it's not just that there's a new normal. There is no normal, or normal is shifting so fast that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think yeah, yeah. I think, and in a way, that's maybe why you need an identity because normal shifts so fast. You need something to hold on to. I, I think in that in that sense, it's quite it's, it's mildly encouraging to see young people reverse engineering human nature on the you know, even having been handed a supposedly completely blank canvas. They're they're reverse engineering more or less what we had before. They're just coming at it in a very complicated way because nobody explained to them that actually human nature is real. I, that's very <laughs> cheery. There's a word for man which is aromantic. It just means you have lost without much romantic connection. You know, it's great. They've invented <laughs> yeah, men as well. <laughs> No, 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 hashtag not all men, but we have we have all met those guys. Yeah, yes. I, some men. Sorry, <laughs> I just meant some men. Yeah. Mary, um, Mary Wakefield, do you think we should worry though that you know we've been talking a lot about sort of young people, and I think there's sort of there is a general theme here, a bit of let kids be kids and they'll they'll grow out of it, or is a or it's a reaction to the world. I mean, do you worry more that when you see it's sort of these sort of concepts adopted by the adult world, for example, in the civil service and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think the trouble is that you know the the, the younger generation might move through these phases. Um, if it weren't for the fact that it's now so embedded in government, in Whitehall and institutions, in a way you're not allowed to move through because you meet the workplace and there it is absolutely stopping you, you know, like the you know, laborious process of adding the A to the LGBT into the civil service and then, you know, lanyard it up. So that acts as a, as a stopper um, in a way. You can't move through, you can't have a phase. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I completely agree. I mean, in 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 as much as I'm, I, I'll shrug my shoulders and say, "Let kids be kids." I think that's you know, doing doing ridiculous things when you're 22 is one thing. I did more than my fair share of ridiculous things when I was 22. But um, it's a whole different ball game if you're proposing to bake the doing of ridiculous things into law and policy. Now, I think it's it seems it seems. Re- Seems to me that the the job of law and policy ought to be uh, as much you know that the law the law is a teacher as is well understood as as much as it is a set of boundaries and guidelines, um, and 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 it's it it seems to me reasonable to expect the law to to have a to to, to be able to make clear statements about what what is actually real and what human nature actually is, you know and we can we can argue the toss over the finer points of that but it seems it seems pretty clear to me that you know humans humans exist both in two sexes you know we have a sexuality is real and you know it has has a, has a default form for a reason and that and that we could we could and should expect the law to reflect this and not simply do its best to tie itself in knots on the basis of individual desire or professed lack of it yeah and those are the people we should be angry with i think you know yeah. um the yeah, people yeah, yeah. who know better the mps the managers who know in their hearts yeah, leave, that leave this the is kids alone but shout vigorously at the civil absolutely. service until yeah. stop being idiots any day 
I mean, Mary Wakefield, so Mary Harrington mentioned before that there might be sort of a practical element to asexuality for young women in particular, maybe who don't want yeah. to sort of, you know, put off sexual advances, for example. Do you think do you think that's going on in the adult world as well a bit? I mean, it's kind of handy to have to be part of a, an oppressed minority these days. Well, it's obviously handy. I mean, it's the only way forward. I mean, I'm considering it. Um, Yes, I mean, I think as, as adults identifying as asexual seem often to be autistic to me and often women, which is the same as a lot of these um, identities, you know, and again, I think it probably fixes them in place. Um, so I think probably the same dynamics are at play there. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, Mary. That's it for this week. Once again, if you enjoy Spectator TV, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon so you never miss an episode again. Thanks again for watching and do join us again next week.